<laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We are here live with uh, Life. I was going to say Life with Ryan. The infamous RJ and Megan SF and myself, US Brian 28, on system.debug. And then we'll like, be do, be 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 Right. Ryan, if you listen to the if you listen to the audio, Ryan will come back and probably put that in. But for you video watchers, it's not going to happen this episode. Yeah. Missed out Sorry, on that. I really want him to do not to not to already stray from the topic, but I really want him to do because he did that acoustic mm -hmm. one, and I freaking love that thing, dude. It was so great. I wish we could get him to actually record an acoustic one. Why don't we just make him do it? I mean, I think we have to put pressure on him socially, social pressure. Yeah, we can peer pressure him. He's really really susceptible I mean, to peer pressure. He's very susceptible. That's his weakness. <laughs> oh, boy. Brian's already, like, pissed off at us. He's Not like, at all. But why does it always? He's, he's like, off topic. No, off topic. But I was going to oh, say, man. this is our 40th Sorry. episode. So that's kind of a cool thing, right? 40 episodes where we've actually got out and done this live in front of people. And we want to thank as always, the people who have watched. And if you're watching for the first time, don't be afraid to like and subscribe to the channel. Um, but and all in all, we've done like between your um, your other episodes, my other episodes. I mean, we're over 50 now, right? Something like that. Total for bit. the channel. Quite a wow. bit, definitely because of your episodes, your six minute sales forces. Nice. Man, I I'm thought gonna we clean were my camera, camera just so now you guys don't want to kill me. We'll My camera's all hazy. Watch this. <laughs> What's funny is he wiped in front of the screen and then. <laughs> <laughs> it was just I like the magic. All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about code freeze on our 40th episode. Uh, what is code freeze? Um, thanks, Jarrett. I, I I really thank you for that. <laughs> My, <laughs> he's got them all out. He's got them all there. Not yeah, all of them. Out. There's another one right here. Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> it's got most of them. So, RJ, can you tell us what a code freeze is? <laughs> can I ever? But no, I don't want to. Um, yeah. So, code freeze is everyone's favorite topic, of course. Um, it's basically when you have a certain amount of stuff that you've done for that sprint, uh, effectively, and you want to say, look, we can't make any more changes to this. So we need to put a freeze on and we need to say, okay, no more changes. This is the code. This is our, all of our code. This is everything that's going to production sans any hot fixes, any bug fixes. So <clears throat> traditionally you have a dev environment, a staging environment and a production environment. And your produ production environment is completely sealed Nobody touches that. Nobody ever goes in and makes changes directly to production unless you are a uh, <laughs> wild, wild west cowboy that decides that they don't want to have a weekend, especially if you do it on a Friday. Um, but nobody nobody makes changes to production. In generally. a perfect world. In a perfect world, yes, in Peter Pan land. So <laughs> you have a staging environment, right? And you take a whole bunch of stuff in staging, and that gets essentially automatically pushed out to prod via some mechanism uh, without a lot of human hands touching it. And usually this, the, the code freeze is on staging where you say, okay, we're gonna either block anything coming into staging, anything pr being promoted to staging uh, from dev or whatever your mechanism is for, for promoting stuff to staging. You say, okay, I'm gonna cut that off or I'm gonna basically tell people to just stop making changes in staging period. So somehow you have a chunk of code that just gets frozen. Nobody is messing with it. Nobody's touching it. Nobody's making any changes. And that is a solid uh, block that goes to production. And it's fun. And so who gets to make the changes in staging? Who may, who gets to make the changes in staging? Yeah, like, so, so who's going to be making all these changes in staging during this time? <laughs> well, <laughs> Nobody's going to be making changes in staging. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> so nobody's making changes. Okay. But 
Um, that's the only, so the only changes that are going to be allowed in are showstoppers, right? Anything. So here's just a quick example. You're releasing, um, your software, right? You have V1 is already out there. People are using it, right? You've got, uh, version 1.1 coming out. You've locked down all your changes in staging and you've said, okay, we're good here. This is great. Now you run it through your QA pipeline, however that looks. Um, could be your developers, could be an actual QA staff, could be automated testing, could be automated testing and QA, whatever. You run it through that pipeline, you just make sure everything is perfection, right? Uh, you run your end to ends, your units, you, everything. You find a bug, you find uh, effectively a showstopper bug that says, or, or basically that the, the whole thing is um, one of your main features that you just added is absolutely broken for some edge case. You would then swarm that. Everyone in development would swarm that, fix it. Whoever has the best looking, fastest fix gets checked out first. You do a PR, everything's good, blah, blah, blah. Okay, run through that code, check that code. Run the end-to-end -end test against that code. Everything looks great. Okay, now that gets pushed to staging but only, only showstopper bugs, usually. Awesome. So yeah, so it should only be bugs that are being fixed and changed and yeah. changes to bugs. Awesome. And if it's, like, if it's like a spelling or something, yeah, some people might consider that a showstopper bug. It's really up to your organization to define um, what goes in after or during a code freeze, I, I guess you should say. It's up to your organization to, to figure that out. Um, but most of the time, you don't want small little kind of changes like, oh, man, we called this lop instead of loop. And you're like, oh, goodness, what a error that's going to affect everyone. And no one's ever going to understand anything. And everything's broken now. Everything's on fire. Oh, my goodness. If hey, in, a, yeah. in a community, a spelling error can be a huge deal because that's externally facing. So, well, that's what I'm saying. It's all so, situational. All situational. Yeah. Exactly. So if so, in your organization right now, that is a showstopper bug. So you're yeah. like, okay, this is a showstopper. Boom. Code freeze, not for this thing. Fix it. Okay. Move on. Now code freeze for everyone, and then and then you push. Right? Is is that? So let me ask you guys. Is that what you guys would define um, code freeze as? Yeah. So just to kind of like recap, real like make it. Nice and short. Basically, what you're saying is, as a code freeze is, you've done a cycle of development. Now, in order to give QA and uh, testers the ability to actually test test what's being developed, um, and without introducing any new bugs, you put your code on code freeze and don't touch it for right now until QA comes back with all of the different bugs that they've now found. Exactly. Perfect. Cool. All right. So, what do you what are you thinking, Megan? What's your uh, what's what's your definition? I uh, I absolutely agree. Brian had it perfect. I think. Yeah. The last thing we want to do is introduce any new bugs or try to have any new scope that's being introduced. So, doing that free is making sure we're focusing on what we have. You know, that's what the the next sprint is for adding new stuff. So, I mean, we we can go right back to that in a week. You know, so let's focus on what we've got and then move forward next week. So based on that, like, how long should you keep a code freeze inactive or active? I should say, how how long would you have a code freeze active? And does that mean that you're not doing any development whatsoever during that time, or does it just mean that you're going to branch off into another org and do your development there, um, and then leave your current org that you're actually that you pushed from? Um, or deployed from that's you're just not going to touch that org right or do you stop all development so it depends right again <clears throat> it depends on the structure of your organization right so if you have let's say a very rigid kind of organization where you can't touch anything because uh, effectively the promotion is oh i did something in dev and it auto promotes all the way up through the chain then you just have to halt development completely which is also don't get me wrong i'm not saying anything against this that's absolutely fine actually 
because that gives your developers some time to a but let go of some of the things that have been maybe bugging them like just have 15 minutes to kind of be like okay no code two that gives your developers plenty of time to develop themselves um so you might have a half day where you're doing nothing but learning right so that's one way to do it um and then there are certain very flexible organizations and this is kind of the the range right you've got completely inflexible and then completely flexible and everything in between but a completely flexible organization has i guess essentially what you would call a feature flag um but basically a a flag somewhere in your dev where you can do dev 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 release to a non-prod kind of instance boom everything's there but it doesn't auto promote to staging and staging may or may not auto promote but that doesn't matter because you've cut you've severed that tie there at non-prod so you sever that and then it doesn't matter what you do in non-prod so you keep coding you can code your life away um and it'll never go to staging until the next time where they turn that faucet i guess back on that that flag they kill it and boom now it's auto promoting to staging again i like how you said uh that you know, by doing the code freezes, you can actually kind of give your your developers time to develop themselves, a little bit of downtime. A lot of projects uh, that you're ending up working on, you know, you you kind of put a lot of sweat and tears into it, right? Where you're working nonstop, maybe a bunch of twelve hour days, even in the entire feature development process, especially or sixteen. You know what I mean? But especially uh, as you're getting up close to deployment, right? Um, yeah. And and feature release. And so it is nice to know that, you know, you might have two, three days, even a week of not like downtime where you're not doing anything, but downtime where you are rethinking your development life cycle a little bit or your processes um, and how you are implementing things. And it gives you a chance to, you know, that's like the time uh, to start implementing really cool new tools like uh, Salesforce DX, right? And moving into that because you may have been developing with pure just like Git and an IDE and everybody doing whatever, but then all of a sudden you have this downtime that you can actually commit to saying, you know, okay, for the next week, everybody start with the trail on trailhead. And then we're gonna work from there on a couple of projects and see how we feel about moving everything over into, uh, you know, a Salesforce DX scratch org type, type uh, development process. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely agree with that <clears throat> statement. I, I've got to say, I really like the idea about the fact that, you know, it does give your developers time to work on personal development as well. Um, you know, and that, that idea of getting training and being able to keep up on what's going on in the industry is, is definitely valuable. And it's not even, you know, just valuable for the developer, but it's valuable for your company and for your team. Um, you know, for example, I mean, I know you, you guys have been listening to me messaging about it. I was at Cloud Craze training last week. You know the the new commerce cloud beta um, or B two B, and very exciting, very cool opportunity. Um, and I had, had just had a couple of deployments, so you know it was great opportunity for me to be able to go and have that. And I also have coming up field service lightning training that I'm going to be going to, so I can get FSL certified. And that's not just a win nice. for you know me, but that's just a win for my team too, because those mm -hmm. are both products that are you know be a community specialist. Those are products that are integrated into communities. So it's something that, you know, they're constantly going. CloudCraze hasn't touched one of my projects yet, but it's going to be something that starts coming in. And field service has been touching my projects, but I don't have a background in it. And it's one of those where it's going to be helpful for all of us if I get to know what the other, you know, the other half of the project is doing. And so that downtime, you know, the freeze, that's a great time for, for everybody to gain uh, with that personal development time. So, yeah. so I have a question for you actually about communities, right? You're, so you, your main focus is communities and it has been, as far as I know, for Three as, and long, a half as long years. as, yeah, as long Three as I've known you plus, right? <laughs> I was, I was going to say like forever, but I was like, man, I don't even know how long in, in reality. So I can't even like allude to anything, but so how does how does like staging dev and production how does that kind of stuff work um in inside of just just as as it pertains to communities how does that work uh so it all depends like sometimes we you do have to do those deployments there are a lot more manual steps that you have to do with each one of those deployments though 
Um, your refreshes don't bring over a bunch of things. So setting up each one of those environments is difficult. Um, but one of the one of the biggest things about testing is the fact that oftentimes your clients aren't just having in-house testers. Um, a lot of the times, if you're building like a partner community or customer community, they'll have selected some of their partners or their customers that they actually want to do testing as well. So you actually have this entirely separate testing process too, where you're doing internal testing, then you have this external training testing. So it could be like a guided demo, or you could be actually having them do testing and doing a full on separate training and having this whole second round of UAT testing that happens too. Um, but the, you know, the actual, you know, the phrase, the, the configuration testing, the smoke testing, the, the code review, you know, the regular job testing, all that part stays the same. It's the user testing that gets a, a bit more complex. Interesting. So I, I know that uh, um, when me and Brian were working together, we had kind of a similar thing, but we had like, I don't know, I, I felt like the code freezes were a little uh, more odd due to the fact that it was Salesforce and there's like, Salesforce does that whole like you have two different like full actual orgs, right? Or three yeah. or ho however many full orgs really. Is that the like, so would you do a code freeze the same way in a regular sales Salesforce environment that you would in communities? So um, often the communities ones are longer because you if you do have that additional round of testing, um, because again, you know, you have to freeze for you know, the internal testing, then you have to freeze for that partner and customer testing too, uh, which just gives you additional time. Uh, but also, I mean, it, it's something you have to plan for in advance and you have to know about. It's something you have to, especially in consulting, you have to start prepping your customers early and make sure that that is built into your timeline and that you have that buffer for it. Um, otherwise, you're going to, it's easy to start falling behind. Uh, just because that is an added, you know, one to two weeks that you can have put in there. Interesting. Yeah, I remember, I don't know how long it was for us. Brian, you could probably speak to this better, but we had like, we had at least a couple days of, um, of code freeze, right? Yeah, we, I mean, it was usually at least a couple of days where you're just <clears throat> nothing but downtime. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I think it was like December. That was a big, big slow month for us. But yeah, e either way, and that's another thing just for everyone to kind of keep in mind, code freezes aren't um, some explicitly defined amount of time. It's whatever it takes <laughs> in reality. Yeah. That's just so what it is, what it let is. Me, let me ask you this. Would you say that they take away or add to the agile development process? Uh, I don't know. That's that's kind of a weird question, right? Because what is agile? Agile is this kind of like amorphous sort of blob, and a lot of people take it and and they take what they like out of the core uh, agile framework, I guess you would call it, or, or methodology. They just grab what they like, boom, and they yank that out, and then they throw, they sprinkle whatever they're secret sauces or whatever they think their secret sauce is on top of that, right? So Agile is, a, I mean, everywhere I've ever worked, Agile is completely different. Um, again, the core is there, but other pieces are not. So I think in reality, if you were to do Agile the correct way and do code freezes the correct way with QA, like if everything, again, Peter Pan land, it, it works out to to be such that it'll add to the agile process because what will happen is you'll get a couple more quick uh, iterations with those little hot fixes that we talked about earlier. Um, and then it'll go out. And what should happen is you still, you're, you can still plug away over here at your uh, dev environment while all the other stuff is frozen. So you should, I mean, technically depend depending on again, tech specs, org specs, like everything that happens in, in real world, depending on all that stuff, um, you may or may not have downtime. And that if you don't have downtime, that's only going to add to your to your agile experience. And if you do have downtime, again, that's not bad, because you can you can give that back to your developers and effectively 
if, if they, again, Peter Pan land, if they do everything right, they're going to increase their knowledge base by some whatever degree. And that will hopefully allow them to work more efficiently and, and faster in the future. So, you know what I'm saying? I, I definitely don't think that they, they take away from it. Um, just because of the fact that during the time when you have your code phrase, that's the time in which you can be planning for your next sprint. And you can yeah. be working on your group and you can be working on getting those tickets ready. You can be, you know, deciding, you know, working on the documentation for the stuff that you just did if you didn't do it before. Um, you know, polishing up UAT scripts, things like that. So there's always something you can be doing. So it's not like you you would ever have 100% downtime and lose. Um, so I think that, you know, they I can definitely see where they'd be a benefit by giving you that break that you need from the go, 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 so that you can do the stuff that, you know, that has to be done anyway. Yeah. I mean, and again, it depends if you're really doing agile or if you're doing like one of the, like the XP or the lean or this or that, there's so many different little things that you could be doing, right? So like you said, you could do uh, iteration planning. So your IPMs, you could even do a retro if you wanted to, right? And do your, do your weeks retrospective or your sprint retrospective and say like, all right, what do we do right? What do we do wrong? And what are we kind of middle of the road about? Get that down and build your action items based off of that, right? So, oh man, well, uh, we did this thing wrong. So we're going to do this uh, next sprint. And we're going to try this next sprint, right? So again, just bouncing off of what Megan said, absolutely great idea. Um, just do your planning, do your retros, do all of your other things um, that you would do on a normal week in maybe not your downtime, but this week do it in your downtime and then give your engineers back that, that dev time that they want. What about you, Brian? I mean, I, I kind of agree with you in that it is, it doesn't take away. It only adds because now as a, as a developer, it is nice to be able to actually have that time to plan your next sprint. Right. Um, to be able to sit down and get with your PMs and your uh, the owners of the product and, and your your managers and say, okay, this is what hurt me on the last time. So we need to find a way to balance, you know, the number of cases or the number of features that we are going to be pushing out. Um, and you can also, it's a good time to adjust for, you know, when your team size is either increased or decreased, right? So you need to uh, be able to adjust for that. Like a lot of times, you know, you'll start these sprints and we'll say that even if it's a, a decent sized epic of a sprint, right? You you may have scheduled out tasks for four developers, but by the end of that sprint, one of them's left, right? So everybody kind of had to dish out that load. So it's a good time for, um, you know, a reassessment of your resources. Yeah, recalibration, also a very good point. You guys are just coming in with the great points today. So, all right, we covered code freeze, right? We did the definition of code freeze. What is it? What is it all about? We've kind of talked, not necessarily circles around this thing, but we've talked about most of the most of the kind of upsides. Like we're really kind of selling this thing up for code freezes. So, real quick, for you guys, are there any I guess maybe not even just downsides, but any like meh sides and any downsides as well to a code freeze. Sometimes you just see something and you're just like, oh, this would have made it so much better if I just could put this in. And so there there are times when when little get me's have come and you kind of go, I have to wait until you know QA pushes back with the rest of the bugs or the next feature release before I can implement like i mean even so much as like i populated a select list with a bunch of values um from three different arrays that i've concatenated only now i realize that they're not sorted because it's json and so i wish i would have had this little method in there to actually alphabetize all the pick list options from those different arrays but you know what it's not show stopping and it's not the yeah. time to put it in and then create a bug for it and all this other kind of stuff so sometimes and that stings and it's, it's, I've learned that it's not always worth it to make those small changes. It's rarely worth it because in the end, you know, it ends up causing more problems than 
and benefits. Um, you know, that one thing that you did, you you put one little typo in it and now you did something and then you've got the trickle down effect where, you know, now you've got eight problems when you didn't even have a problem to begin with. And now it's, you know, two o'clock in the morning and you're exhausted and, you know, you're getting emails and people are pissed and you're like, I just wanted to fix it. I'm so sorry. I'll never and you know, again. somewhere in your code, there is a variable named updirt. And you're all like, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, and, and then you have to reference that variable because it's a global variable now. And so elsewhere in your code, there's everyone's referencing the updirt variable. You know, <laughs> and you're just like, oh, do you updirt your record? And you'll never live it down. Right. Right. <laughs> I can't tell you how many typos I've seen in that, <laughs> in that code base we worked on, Brian. Oh my goodness. Infinite, infinite, nearly infinite. Or um, <laughs> it's great to get like a spell check and you're not uh, sublime personally. Like, right? It's a really, <laughs> really big deal. It's, a it's small got plug for a reason. It's got plug yes, Exactly. <laughs> it just takes a second to do it. Like, control shift P, install, spell check. Oh man. <clears throat> so, um, those are, those are pretty good. Those are pretty good. Um, kind of, I guess not really downsides, but little, little, I don't know what you would call them. Quirks that developers have, like you just, you just want to yeah. fix a thing, but I'm a hundred percent on Megan's side of this debate. And I know it's not really a debate, but I'm totally on Megan's side where you just like, you clip one thing, a little, you're like, oh, da, 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 oh, I'm just gonna do. Let me just do this real fast, and you punch yeah. in like a whole beautiful like ternary statement, which Ryan Hibley hates, or whatever it is. You punch it in, and you're like, yes, I nailed this. And you submit your code, and everything looks great. And then QA's like, all right, well, we had zero bugs, but now we have thirteen. And you're right. like, wait, wait, what? I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we got thirteen bugs now for you, and you're like, oh. No. Why did oh. why did I do this at four thirty on Friday? Right. So yeah, that's just I don't wait. know. Yeah, just I would wait. I would yeah, I would hundred percent just wait. I would, even though it would really bug me that night when I'm like going trying to go to sleep, it would really, really bug me and it would probably eat at me the whole weekend. But at least it would only be myself yelling at me and not right some client that's really, really pissed about their data or their uh, visual force page or their triggers or whatever it happens to be. And and you can write it, just don't save it to their org. Like, True. Get that's, ready yeah. to go. Just don't, just don't upload it. Like, just, yeah, you're good. <laughs> write it, do not do it. it. Change requests, do don't do it. <laughs> do it, do it, do, but don't do it. Do it, do it secretly. Do it. In the background. No, go forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So say it. Yeah, good, good life advice to anyone who's a junior programmer. Write the thing you want to write, and don't um. Just save it locally. Just don't, just don't push it. Just leave it as is. Yeah. Leave it in progress. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Just in progress. Oh. And then... oh, dude, you guys have four fifty nine already. Thank you, Batman. Your time. In your time. I was yeah. like, oh, you still got half the day. <laughs> yeah, you got plenty of, plenty of day left, dude. What's your daylight looking at like outside? Is it is it bright out still? I don't know, dude. I don't go out there. I keep the blinds closed. <laughs> the sun's still out. <laughs> I, just, I do not. Brian has to watch me turn the lights on. <laughs> well, all right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on tonight's episode of System.Debug. Remember, if you did enjoy the episode or didn't, please subscribe. And like it anyway, or don't like it, or don't Are do we it. We're wearing the same shirt. No, I highly doubt that. Yep. No. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I wore that. I wore that shirt sure. last week. <laughs> I love I'm just that. Shirt. Sure. I didn't know. It looks like the same color well, blue. If we were wearing the same shirt, then then I mean, I we would have two heads too. coming out of it because <laughs> we would both be wearing the same. We'd be in the same shirt. <laughs> I've done that with Brian Hubbard once. Yeah. Pictures on Facebook. 
if you, <laughs> if you want to check those out. Anyway, sorry, Brian. I did not mean to. I don't. I don't know what's happening. You cut my dad joke off. You cut my dad joke off. Subscribe to our YouTube channel because we're awesome. That's right. If you yes. want to continue to watch the show. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great night. <laughs> Bye. Thanks,